study Collector 6 of Advanced Inference in Graphical Models, which is something that I'm compelled to say even though I've already spoken to you for about 10 minutes offline. Those of you who are watching this on YouTube will have to uh, wonder and ponder and be tantalized about what possible secrets did we reveal offline that are not being revealed on YouTube. Um, if you're interested in finding out, then you can reverse engineer who, as a student, took this class and contact some of them. So, or you can contact me, either way. Um, oh, one announcement. Uh, I think I've already said this to everybody, but in case someone's not here, uh, homework one is out. It's on the Canvas uh, webpage. It is due at 11.45 PM next Tuesday. OK, so today what we're going to do is, uh, is sort of start uh, talking a little bit more about how to do inference sort of in earnest on, um, on general graphical models. And we're sort of calling this multiple queries. And multiple queries really means that we're interested in um, computing the marginal probability distributions over all of the original graph uh, cliques. Because, as we've said a number of times now, if we have the marginal distribution over all of the original graph cliques, that basically gives us enough information for doing most of the things that we would want to do when, say, we're either using the model for a scientific endeavor or we're interested in trying to adjust the model based on, on some data for the purposes of learning. And in doing so, we're going to be developing a number of, in some sense, structures, maybe even data structures, but others might call them graph theoretical properties and constructs that will allow us to essentially morph or transform from an original graph into a structure which is so reminiscent to a tree that, in fact, it is a tree, and it essentially allows us to do inference you know, definitely analogously and perhaps almost identically to the way that we did inference when we had an original tree very early on in the class. And uh, you're going to see the, uh, you know, you're going to start seeing, and uh, you've already seen some of these properties. Like, for example, we saw in a triangulated graph how there always exists two simplicial nodes. Um, there are going to be other properties like that that we're going to see. Uh, that are very tree-like. So before we begin, let's just do a little bit of a recap. Um, so these are things all from last lecture, just to remind everybody. So if we have a triangulated graph, if there are more than or equal to two nodes, we always have two simplicial nodes, like I just mentioned. If the graph is triangulated, it, there's a perfect elimination order and vice versa. Um, all minimal triangulations of a graph can, create, can be created using uh, the elimination algorithm. And elimination uh, minimal, in this case, means Fill in edge minimal, meaning that if it's the case that any we take any subset of the set of fill in edges, it's no longer uh, triangulated. That's considered a, a minimal graph, minimal triangulation of a graph. Um, we define the notion of k trees, um, which are generalizations of regular trees, which are called one trees. Sometimes I think I forgot to mention this last time, but there sometimes these k trees are called hyper trees, um, and you have hyper edges. Uh, and all minimal separators in a k tree are k cliques. Um, I, I guess I should, let me just uh, qualify that about hypertrees. So hypertrees, uh, k-trees are hypertrees, but not necessarily vice versa. Um, so all minimal separators in a k-tree are k-cliques, and we talked about the notion of partial k-trees, which also would be a hypertree for large enough, and in fact could correspond to any hypertree for large enough k. And we also talked about the notion of embeddability. Embeddability of one graph into another graph, we can always embed a graph into a k-tree for a large enough k. And we talked about a procedure for doing that. Um, and that's basically this property. Any, any triangulated graph, g, g prime, can be embedded into a k tree where k plus 1 is the size of the largest clique in g prime. So that means that any graph can be embedded into a k tree, right? Because so, any graph can be embedded into any of its triangulations, and any of its triangulations can be embedded into a k tree for a large enough k. The problem, of course, is to find the smallest k such that the original graph can be so triangulated and then, and then embedded into a k tree, but that's an NP complete problem. We also talked about various inapproximability results associated with that problem. And therefore, we resorted to various heuristics for triangulating a graph, min fill, min size, and various randomization pro uh, variants. And we also talked about the maximum cardinality search algorithm. In fact, this is the last slide of last lecture, uh, which we skipped over a little bit. But basically, um, the maximum cardinality search algorithm essentially produces a reverse elimination order. And what it does is it chooses a node, and then it basically chooses the next node, which has um, 
the set of previous labeled neighbors having maximum cardinality, and it, if it's the case that the set of previous labeled neighbors, those with maximum cardinality, are complete, then it basically continues on. Otherwise, it reports back that it's not triangulated. That can be made to run in order n plus m, or n order the size of uh, v plus the size of e. Um, and the other thing I should mention is that it's also possible to triangulate a graph using maximum cardinality search. You can essentially, as you're going backwards, you look at the set of previously labeled neighbors. So normally, if it's the case that if it's complete, you say, OK, fine, you're already triangulated. If you're not, if you're not um, complete, if you're previously labeled, if, you're, if the previous labeled set of neighbors of you is not complete, you just complete them and then go forward. And then, of course, if you run it again, it's going to essentially be a perfect elimination order in reverse. Um, however, it's actually, for, for various reasons, not a particularly good um, triangulation heuristic. When you run MCS as a, as a, for the purposes of triangu triangulating a graph, it's usually the case that minfill works better. Um, okay, so we have these two theorem, the theorem and the corollary. So here, let's let's go on to talk about multiple queries and what we mean by that. So, um, actually, for a second, are there any questions on on review, on the review stuff? Okay, so um, let's talk about multiple queries. So, like we saw in the case of a tree, you know. We often want this marginal, the probability of x sub c for all c and c. So script c is the set of all cliques in the original graph. And, and remember, the cliques in the original graph are the things that allow for the factors. And so you've got this probability distribution, which is basically a product of set of factors. And each factor involves a bunch of random variables, which in order for it to be within the family corresponding to the graphical model, must correspond to a clique. And so at the very, very least, we want, if we want to say, for example, learn within those factors, you know, because the factors are sort of parameterized things uh, that couple and inextricably couple and bundle and intertwine variables together and mean that the variables directly interact with each other. And so there are parameters associated directly with variables interacting. And we need the marginal in order to essentially learn those parameters. And so we want to have all of these marginals very analogously to what we saw in the clique. And so what we could do, for example, is run the elimination algorithm multiple times, each time running elimination culminating in a final set of variables of size, the size of c, and then doing that however many cliques there are. Uh, now that, very much like we saw in the tree, would be extremely wasteful. Um, and what we saw also in the case of the tree, that you know, when we think of elimination as message passing algorithms, we can essentially gain more efficiency uh, by um, and uh, by by essentially having more having more desire or more need for more marginals, and what we end up doing is we we reuse the me the messages, which essentially corresponds to dynamic programming. And the question we want to solve today and, and next lecture is is can we do this for arbitrary graphs? Now this is still again exact inference. I have to mention, so we're spending time on an exact inference, but I think, like I said before, this will give us a good foundation upon which we can build when we start addressing some of the approximate inference procedures. Um, OK. Um, now, the other thing we should mention also is that since this is, this is exact inference, uh, we're considering only really the class of triangulated models. Because you know, when we run elimination, um, it's inevitably going to entail a triangulated model. right? But the question really is, so we, 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 and this, this is where we saw there might be a problem. You might think that there is a problem. So in the, in the case of a tree, we can just start sending these messages. And we send messages along all directions, both directions and of every edge. And if we follow the message passing protocol, we're sort of done. We can get all marginals. Here now we're saying we run elimination. We get a triangulated graph. Maybe we spend all this time finding a good elimination order to produce one particular marginal. And we get this triangulated graph. But the question is, is that triangulate, triangulated model necessarily going to be optimal for all of the clique marginals that we might want? So um, what do you think? I mean, it might seem like maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe one triangulated graph is, is suboptimal for one marginal, even if, even if it's optimal for another marginal. And of course, you know, we need to define what we, what we mean by optimal. But um, a triangulated graph. Um, First of all, remember, is a cover 
of G. So what we mean by a cover is that the original graph can be embedded into its triangulated cover, its triangulated variant. And so what this means is that if you're a clique in the original graph, which means that you, you can involve a factor, let's say that you're a clique C in the cliques of G, that means since it, there's a cover, there has to exist another clique, C prime, in the triangulated cover, where C prime is the superset of C. Okay. Why is that? Because the triangulation is the superset of the set of edges. So certainly if you're a clique in the original graph, you're a clique in the other, uh, in the other graph. So you must be either still a clique in the triangulated graph or your subset of some clique. Okay. So what that means is that if it's the case that you've been able to efficiently compute this triangulated graph clique marginal, you know, P of X C prime, then we can compute the original graph clique marginal by just summing out the variables that are in this, the super clique that are not in the sub clique. So that's, that's what this notation here says to do. We're basically summing out in this, this thing here, we're summing out everything in C prime but not in C, or all of the variables X of C prime not in C. And then we've got this, which is our desired marginal for the original graph clique. And the cost of doing this is going to be R to the size of C prime. So the cost is still going to be, uh, it's going to have complexity exponential in the size of the clique in the triangulated graph. Okay. So it's the same cost as whatever the cost of the triangulated graph. And so, so remember how we saw that, for example, when we do this, this edge clique cover like triangulation, via the elimination problem, the cost of doing that is equal to the largest elimination clique uh, in the, uh, that we encounter. So it's order k plus 1, or k is the max set of neighbors that we encounter during elimination. So that basically means that the cost of doing inference in, uh, for, any, for any marginal, once we've got a triangulated graph, for any elimination order is going to be still the same, because we can still get any clique that we might want in the original graph. Um, now, when we find this optimal K-tree embedding, this, it's optimal in the sense that it minimizes the maximum clique for any triangulation G. So it's finding the smallest, largest clique cover. Um, and so if we find this embedding, by this argument, we're still going to be optimal for any of the original graph clique marginals. Because if we've minimized the exponent over the whole graph, we're also going to since we care really about the exponent of the complexity, that's what, we measure, what we're measuring cost in, is that exponent, um, the size of the largest clique. And if we minimize that by finding the best elimination ordering, we're also going to have minimized it over all, for, for all uh, original graph marginals. So that also means that maybe we, if, it, if, an, if we haven't found the ideal elimination order, but let's say we found a good one by running the heuristics sufficiently, then that basically means that that effort, that effort that we spent on finding that elimination order can be amortized over, uh, the, or the cost of that can be amortized over computing all of the original graph marginals that we, what we need. So we can essentially spend all our time just trying to find a good elimination order, which seems like it's, it's, it's really good news. So even though it's an NP-complete problem, we can spend some time on the heuristics and offline, maybe spend a weekend on it or something, come back on Monday and we'll have an elimination order that actually works for all of our original graph marginals. Um, now, the other thing that uh, we should talk about is this issue of if we, if we want um, non-clique marginals. So in the subtree, we saw that we could potentially be in trouble. Like, for example, if we want the probability of, of two leaf nodes jointly, then that's essentially going to create a non-tree. Right. The same situation happens here. Like, for example, if it's the case that we're interested in a marginal piece of X of L, where L is not an original graph clique, then this process um, might not work. And in fact, L itself could turn into a clique, and it could, could turn into the worst clique, because we eliminate a bunch of other stuff. And if it's the case that there's a path that starts in L, goes outside of L, and circles around, and goes back into L. It's a cycle. And by Rose's theorem, it essentially means that for any set two variables that are connected by a path out uh, consisting of variables that we eliminate first, that means that those variables are going to be coupled together effectively, thereby increasing potentially the exponential the cost exponentially in the size of L, uh, of what it would be if we weren't interested in that query. So, so that essentially is 
is an inevitability. So one way we could look at this is that if we triangulated a graph via the elimination process, and then somebody comes up with an L, uh, for, which is not a clique in the triangulated graph, then we can say that that, that is an invalid query for that triangulation. That, that triangulation doesn't cover that query, so that triangulation won't work. But the question is, what do we do in that case? There's an easy fix, although it might not be a very computationally attractive fix. At least conceptually, there's an easy fix. And so what we do is we just go back to the original graph, and then we turn L into a clique, not necessarily a max clique, and then we triangulate again. Because we know that the cost of L, cost of X of L might be, might be a, um, a clique. And then once we do that, then in the triangulated graph where L has been completed, we're, we're assured that L is going to be a, a subclique of some clique in the triangulated graph, and we can then do the same thing. So in some sense, the query can change the graph. The query does change the graph by adding edges effectively. Now, one can be essentially maybe a little bit smarter about it. Obviously, if L induces a subtree, in the, if the original graph is a tree and L is, L is induces a subtree, you probably wouldn't want to do this. So you know, if, if L induces, say, a K tree, where k plus 1 is smaller than l, you also wouldn't want to do this. But what, what you could do is embed l, the, you know, the vertices l, into a k-tree of the smallest k, and then create that, make that a sub-k-tree within the original graph. And that would also work as well. Very similar to what we saw in the case when l was a subtree in the original tree. OK, any questions about that? Okay. So this, I think, is, is very nice. It's very, in some sense, almost remarkable that we can essentially, for any clique query, we can reuse the elimination order that we spent time finding. This is an amortization process, like I said. Um, but in, on the other hand, we want to share more than just the elimination order. What we saw in the case of trees is that we're also sharing the, the messages. We've, we use the dynamic programming pro uh, property so that if a message was sent, that message was not sent um, foolishly. That, that message is sent in a way such that, that anybody who needs that message can use the computation that was spent on that message. And so there has to be some set of rules that will allow us to do that. Now, we've already encountered the message passing protocol. And in fact, that's going to be exactly the same set of rules that, incur that allow us to do that. But of course, we need to morph any graph into a construct where, once again, the message passing protocol applies. Because the message passing protocol applies to trees. So we have to somehow get a, a, a tree again. So this is our goal. In non-tree graphs, we want to reuse the work of computing the marginals for the sake of getting multiple marginals. And so this is what we're going to see. This, you know, Like I said, this remarkable, amazing fact is that um, if we find the optimal elimination order for one clique query, we found it for all clique queries of the graph. OK, we're going to start now. This is sort of the idea of where we're going. Any questions on the idea before we get into the mechanics? So is it clear to everybody? OK. So a decomposition um, of a graph. This is a an operation on a graph that might or might not be possible. So a decomposition of a graph, if it exists, like I said, might, not, might or might not be possible, is a partition of the set of nodes. So it's a partition into A, B, C. So partition means that A, that the a B, and C don't intersect. Okay, so it, uh, it's a partition such that C is a separator. Uh, so C separates A from B. So again, that means that any path from A to B must go through C. And it also has to be the case that C is a clique. And if it's the case that um, uh, A and B are not empty, the decomposition is non-trivial, or sometimes it's called proper. So it's a proper decomposition if it's the case that A and B are not empty. So the question is then, if, if we've got a decomposition of a graph, what does it mean for any member in the family associated with that graph? Because of the semantics of Markov random fields, since C is a separator from A to B, between A and B, it must mean that any the x of a, the random variables x of a, is independent of x of b given x of c. Okay? And in such case, we can write that independence property uh, in the following way. So the, the joint distribution over x of a, x of b, and x of c, which is equal to the distribution over everything, can be validly written in this way. 
This is the definition of condition, or a definition, one of the definitions of conditional independence, that it's equal to the probability, probability of x of xb times the probability of xb of xfc divided by the probability of xc. Now, notice that on the numerator, we've got two factors. Each factor consists of a joint over the separator and this sort of component that that separator breaks the graph into. And, and then on the denominator, we've got um, uh, the separator itself, the marginal over the separator. Okay. So um, the next definition we have is this notion of a decomposable model. Yep, question. This is the joint. It's not given. So if we did the probability of x of a, sorry, so x of a, x of b given x of c, that would be the joint in the numerator. You need, you need to have that because it's the probability of x of a, x of b given x of c, which breaks apart based on the conditional independence. Probability of x of a given x of c times the probability of x of b given x of c. That means that you would, that, that uh, you, you have to uh, account for that twice in. And that cancels out, and then you only have that guy in the numerator once. Okay. Okay. So um, everybody see that? Okay. Um, so now, if if we've got uh, so so this is the, this is the definition of a decomposable model. So basically, a model or sorry, a graph. This is this is really a graph theoretical property. Graph theoretic theoretic property. Um, a decomposable model is either a clique. Or it's the case that there exists a proper decomposition ABC such that both the subgraph induced by A and C and by B and C are decomposable. So it's a recursive definition. It essentially creates essentially a tree. So this is again the subgraph. Everybody remember what this means, hopefully. This is the subgraph induced by the vertices A union C. So that basically means that we take all of the vertices indexed by A and C, we throw away any of the vertices not indexed by A and C, and we only take the edges that are incident to edges to, to vertices both in A and C. So it's a, a vertex-induced subgraph. And the other thing to note about this is that the separator is contained in both subgraphs. Just like, you know, so in the decomposition, um, uh, we essentially have the separator in both sides. So I guess the picture, if you will, to think about a decomposable, so we, we essentially have C, and C is a clique, and then we have two pieces here. We have A over here, and maybe B over here. And it has to be the case that both A union C and B union C are also decomposable. And it makes sense because there's a base case. Uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll look at these again. So here's an example of a graph on the left. And there's two decompositions, or I should say two complete recursive decompositions showing that the, this graph is decomposable. So what, first of all, this means, number one, is that there, are, there can be m multiple ways of decomposing a model. But each case essentially produces a tree. And what happens is that if we recurse down, if it's ever the case that we get stuck, that we enter one of the leafs or one of the subgraphs on the left or on the right side not being decomposable, then the model is not decomposable. Okay. So here's an example of one decomposition. So, um, so we, we need to find a decomposition right, where Let's look at the definition again. So here's the, here's the definition, by the way, on one page. We need to find a decomposition, which is a partition, such that C separates A from B and C is a clique. And then for it to be decomposable, the base case has to be that it's a clique, or there's a proper decomposition where both left and right subtree is decomposable. So let's go to this example. So um, we start with. I don't know if you can really see this here, but this is C, D, F. So C, D, and F is complete, right? And 
uh, it has a, a left graph consisting of um, CDFA, which is this guy here. So on the left-hand side, we've got ACDFA. And we can see that ACDFA, also on the left-hand side that I circled in green, is a clique. So therefore, the base case holds on the left-hand side in the clique. On the right-hand side, we've got um, all of this stuff here, which co corresponds to all of this stuff here. All right, now, that's obviously not a clique. But the question is, is it decomposable? So let's find out. So for, there has to be a decomposition. So the decomposition means that, there, that there's a partition in ABC such that C's, C separates A from B and that C is complete. So load, what about like CH? So CH is here, right? And CH. Uh, does partition the graph onto the left-hand and the right-hand side. The left-hand side is going to be this part over here, which is B, C, H, G, which is all of this stuff over here, and the right-hand side, which is this, which consists of all this stuff over here. Okay. Of course, also included, C, H is included in both. So this guy is included on both left and right-hand side. So looking just at the left-hand side again, We can see that BCGH um, over here on the left is not a clique, but there does exist another decomposition based on this separator. So BH separates G from C, so that's another com complete separator. And then on, finally on the left, we've got this clique, BCH, and on the right we have Sorry, that's BGH. My eyes are no longer capable of looking at this and seeing what's on the page. I need glasses, obviously. But anyway, B BGH on the left and, and BCH on the right. Uh, then those are two base cases, those are cliques. So that's a, that's a decomposition. So on the, on the, on the right-hand side, we've got what's called the decomposition tree for the left. And we can see that since we, we get down to all of the leaf nodes, so all of the leaf, leaf nodes are like... Um, Let's highlight them all in red. All the leaf nodes are, are cliques in the graph. And all of the non-leaf nodes, all of the non-terminal nodes in this tree, are separators, which are complete. Uh, there was somebody was raising their hand. Yep. Yeah, so the, the, the definition you're checking, to, if you see between A and B, that's just part of the decomposed, composable definition? Yeah, so here's, here are the two things together on the same page. So basically, we define a decomposition. So decomposition is kind of like a parent and its children. And then decomposable is the whole tree. It's sort of recursively applying a decomposition until we get to this base case, which basically says that it has to be a clique, which is the base case which corresponds to the leaf nodes of the tree. Yeah, question. Uh, I'm just guessing that um, if uh, for uh, like computational purposes, is it, is it better to get a balanced tree? Like um, there, there might not exist a balance tree. So um, this isn't really necessarily um, something that, say, for example, you know, the, the depth of the trees is going to be something that's so critical. And in fact, it turns out, uh, like, if you, if you do, I mean, this is, this is going a little bit of a head, but like a, um, a hidden Markov model is a triangulated model. Uh, it turns out triangulated models are going to be the same as decomposable models. A hidden Markov model has a very, very imbalanced decomposition tree. But on the other hand, inference is very, very fast in a hidden Markov model, right? So the balancing, the balance aspect of the tree doesn't matter. In fact, there can be multiple trees, too. So it, the balance doesn't really, that's not really an issue in this case, because it, you're not, it's not, you're not like measuring complexity based on the depth of the tree. Which ordinarily, if you're doing, say, you know, there are many trees Who's, who represent computational properties where you want the, the depth to be log in the number, the size of the, the object or something, so you want it to be balanced. And if it's not balanced, it's linear. So, th so no, we're not doing that. That doesn't matter. Okay. Yep. So could you explain your uh, note part two where it says possesses uh, comment? Oh, note part two. Yes. 
So um, the one thing, um, yeah, so this is just highlighting this, this property here. It possesses a property decomposition. That doesn't mean that all partitions are going to be a, a proper decomposition. It just means that there has to exist some proper decomposition. Okay. It, any arbitrary partition is probably not going to be a proper decomposition. And so what this means is that um, you know, there's a relationship. Like the, sort of the decomposition sort of depends on the whole tree. Like, if, like certain, bottom, certain things that happen at the bottom might affect what we're allowed to do or not allowed to do in the top if we, if we were to sort of look at the relationships. But it's really like a top-down. It's a recursive top-down definition. So the competition is still limited by the size of the clique and not the shape of the clique. Yes, the, that's exactly right. So the computation is really going to be the size of the exponential and the size of the clique. So this is really a graph theoretic property, which might or might not exist in a graph. But it's a useful property for doing computation, as you'll see. And it's, it's also useful because because we want to essentially have a strong intuition about what are the objects that are going to allow us to turn any graph back into a tree, that allow us to do the same message passing stuff we did and the same message passing protocol that we saw for regular old trees. Um, because it, that's part of the definition. When we're, when we're using decomposition, uh, like a decomposable model, we're never using that. We're always wanting a proper decomposition. But just a pure decomposition allows one side to be empty. So I, I, the way, for example, you can think about it is if you have, if you have, a, if you have a separator which sort of there's only one side. It, does, it doesn't further partition. But that, you know, that doesn't, uh, that's, not a, that's, a notion of a, that's not the notion of a decompos decomposable model. But we're not actually going to be using that, really. So I mean, fair point. You could just eliminate it, and that wouldn't be, that wouldn't affect the flow of the class too much. So yep, another question? Well, you may have hinted at this already, but um, let's suppose that G uh, possesses uh, two property compositions. Uh, how are we to choose which property compositions are movable or wrong? Um, as you will see, it's not going to matter. So, so let's see what we can do, for example, with the probability distribution for any of these decomp decompositions or full recursive decompositions. So the internal nodes in a decomposition tree are complete graphs, complete graphs that are also separators. So this, this, is, this picture here is just the same picture that we saw before. It's just one of those trees. But the question is, what does this mean in terms of being able to write any probability distribution that lives in the family corresponding to this model? So we take any p that lives in the family. We have a graph, and we use the factorization property. And what does it mean? So first of all, if we, if we look at the first, so, so what we're doing here is we're, we're, the first decomposition is going to be based on uh, CDF, right, which is this guy here. That's becoming the separator, which is going to separate it into one, one guy, which is ACDF, and then the other guy, which is all the rest, and the, which then further allows us to decompose the model down into this tree. Okay, so what's this going to allow us to do? Well, the joint distribution over A, B, C, D up to K, first of all, based on that first CDF up here, it allows us to write it into, there's one factor on the left which corresponds to this bit here, another factor on the right which corresponds to all of this stuff over here. And then another factor on the bottom, which corresponds, maybe I should use a different color for that, another factor on the bottom, which corresponds to this bit over here, just the separator. So we've got the two factors on the numerator, which correspond to the, the, the left and the right-hand side, and the denominator and the separator. OK. Now next, let's. Um, Let's forget about that for a minute and write this stuff and this stuff over here. We're just sort of grouping things together. And what we're going to do is we're going to further decompose this factor here. So if we look in the, in the um, actually, 
color-wise, I should be using this color, since we already have the tree marked. So this factor here corresponds to this stuff, which I outlined in whatever color that is, purple. Did you know that I drove by a store yesterday, and there's a store in Seattle called the Purple Store? They sell only things that are purple. You name it, and it's, if it's purple, they sell it. <laughs> it's on Aurora. I felt, I felt really bad. I, was, I felt like, how could a store like that survive? The purple store. <laughs> and, you know, how many times do you have it in your mind to want to buy only purple things? I mean, they, there's, they have things like eggplant, purple t-shirts, Prince albums. <laughs> you name it. It's, it's everything purple. So it, let this be a plug. I felt really sorry for the store. So if you ever need anything purple, look up the purple store in Seattle. This, this includes you also, YouTube audience. We have a purple store. Uh, you don't, probably. So enjoy, indulge. And uh, since this is purple, it, it reminded me of that. But anyway, so here's, we have this purple um, thing on the, on the part of the tree, and we have this purple factor. They s probably sell that in the store, that factor. And we apply the same decomposition, right? So we, um, we, uh, we have a left side, same idea of decomposition, the right side, and the separator. The separator now becomes, it's really hard to see, but let's zoom in a little bit. It becomes this bit here. It's CH. CH is on the denominator. And then we have the left-hand side, which is all this stuff. Let's use a different color. The left-hand side, which is all this stuff, which corresponds to this factor, and the right-hand side, and so forth. So basically, once we un get done with this whole thing, we have this representation here, where all of the leaf nodes in the tree, which remember, we said were cliques in the original graph, are on the numerator, and all of the separators, which are complete because it's a decomposition, are on, on the denominator. So a little bit of a notation uh, or, or definition. We used this a little bit before. So the notion of shattering a graph. So how do we shatter a graph? So we bas basically say that a, a separator S uh, can essentially shatter the graph into one or more connected components. And that's an important term to note. So what we mean by a connected component is that it's a component of a graph that's connected. And then when we extract the separator, when we, when we remove, this is a really important construct to prove a theorem that we're going to prove in a few, in a, a, little, bit, a little bit later. But when we remove the separator, it, by, by definition, it's going, there's going to be one side and another side. And there might be other stuff as well. But the point is that it breaks the graph apart into multiple connected pieces where one of the connected pieces is internally connected, but it's not connected to any other inter uh, internally connected pieces. And so we say that S shatters the graph into those components. And so let's say that D, this is the shattering coefficient. This is actually going to be really important for approximate inference uh, when we start talking about it. But the shattering coefficient, D, is the number of components that the separator S shatters, shatters the graph into. So for example, on this graph here on the left, when we remove the separator A, it shatters the graph. This looks like a shattered graph, doesn't it? Into three connected components. And moreover, by the way, here's a decomposition of that graph. It's, it, it's a full recursive, de it's, a de it's a decomposable model, obviously. And notice that we've used the separator as a non-terminal in the decomposition tree. Um, twice, which is one less than the shattering coefficient of that separator. And somebody had their hand up a minute ago. Wait, uh, could you go back to the previous slide real quick? Uh, I'm a bit fuzzy on why the separator appears in the denominator. I understand the uh, numerator, and that uh, corresponds to um, uh, factoring. But um, why is the separator in the denominator? Well, so why is the separator in the denominator? So if we go back to, for example, like this, this slide here, so remember, we said that C is the separator of A and B. And so what it means, based on the definition of conditional independence, is that the separator, here's the separator and the denominator. And so what we do is we just sort of, we, then we keep operating on another piece of the graph. And then the separator again appears on the denominator. And then it again appears on the denominator. And if, if we sort of look at 
the consequences of the conditional independence properties that are implied by recursively applying the decomposition property down to the leaf nodes in a decomposable model, we end up getting this representation. Now, it turns out this representation for a decomposable model will be critical. Notice, notice that in this representation, we've got a product of factors in the numerator and a product, product of factors in the, in the denominator. What this means is that it is possible to have products of factors where each factor is a true marginal. Okay? This was getting back into the question that you had about does that, is that, like, is this thing conditional independence? Yes, it is. Uh, and in fact, not only that, but these factors can really be the marginals. We're getting a, a representation of the distribution where these factors are marginals. Now, why is this important? Because, you know, it seems like we've got a representation where the answer that we want is right here, right? The answer, or, or right there, or right here, if you're on YouTube. I'm always on the left side of the screen, so it's right, right about over there, right down there, somewhere. Am I pointing to it? Somewhere around there. It's over this way. Um, so um, what this means maybe is that if we have a representation or maybe a data structure where we've got sort of structures corresponding to factors that aren't yet marginals, maybe we can munge around or manipulate these factors in such a way such that the resulting structures end up being marginals. Here it's showing that, at least in the case of the decomp decompositional mo decomposable model, it's possible. But we haven't yet connected decomposable models with anything else we've talked about. So uh, one of the things uh, corresponding to that is, uh, you know, when it's the case that the shattering coefficient is greater than two, the separator marginal is used more more than once in the denominator, and so we have this general form of a possible representation of any joint distribution that is within the family of a decomposable graph. So basically what it means is that if you're a member of that family, you can validly be represented in, as in equation 6.2. So that's what this means. So notice that a four cycle, so remember the four cycle? The humble little four cycle, there it is, is not decomposable. Why? Because there are no separators that are complete. So there are conditional independence properties. So like for example, we can write this joint distribution as the probability of x1, x2, x4, and the probability of x1, x3, x4, given this separator, x1 and x4. But notice that x1 and x4 is not complete. And so that means that we can't further, there's, there's another independence property in the graph, which is that um, given x2 and x3, x1 and x4 are independent, but we can't use that simultaneously in producing this sort of recursive expression of the factorization properties of the, of the model. So we can't simultaneously use that and also this, right? So one of them has to be, you know, not usable. Now what we could do, of course, is we could triangulate the model. We could add the edge. And in fact, suppose we add the edge x1 and x4. So that, first of all, that removes an independence assumption. It removes that gray independence assumption. But it um, means that all that that now it's decomposable, and we've, we've now gotten to the base case where x1, x2, x4 is a clique, and x1, x3, x4 is also a clique, and then x1, x2 is a complete separator in the case when it's triangulated. That true, the separator cannot be a maximum clique. Um, we're going to talk about that. So the separators are not maximal, are not maximal cliques, right? But what about the leaves of the decomposition tree? I think we have this theorem. You're, you're sort of anticipating exactly the next slide, which is, I mean, just by definition, the separators are not going to be the max cliques. Why? Because consider the base case, right? So you've got a separator. On the left-hand side, we've got a clique. On the right-hand side, of a clique. The separator is necessarily a subset of the clique, so the separator is not going to be a max clique. The question, however, is might the leaves be max cliques? <laughs> 
Separators are definitely not. Let's, let me, if this is not clear, let me give you an example. Um, so let's say we've got um, this graph uh, with um, um, let's say this side over here. Uh, this side over here. Okay, so we've got now. Well, first of all, let's 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 outline the separator, in in maybe blue or something. So here's the separator, right? And then um, on the left, on one side, we've got this clique. And on the other side, we've got another clique. But the separator is necessarily going to be a subset of the cliques. I don't know if the colors look very good to you guys, but here's a zoom in of that. But um, you can see that that guy, basically the separator, which is the darkest color, is not going to be a max clique, because it's a subset of the max clique. Because of this is, and this is just the base case of the decomposition. But we do have the following proposition, which is that all of the max cliques, remember max cliques is our termination of maximal cliques, not maximum cliques. All max cliques, all maximal cliques in the graph are in the leaf nodes of the decomposition tree. So why is that the case? Is that if you're a base case, you know, so the leaf node is a clique, right? If it's not the case, then it's not decomposable. That has to be the base case. And eventually you run out of nodes since there's a finite number of nodes in the graph. So if it's the case that the max clique was not a, if the leaf node was not a max clique, so we definitely know that the leaf nodes has to be a clique. The question is, must it be a max clique? But suppose it was the case that the leaf load was not a max clique. Okay, so it was just a regular old clique. It was not a max clique. But that means that it must be contained in a max clique, right? And it got split by its parent. Um, and the, its parent is a separator. Um, but that can't be possible because if, if a clique is a part of a max clique, that means that there is no separator between it and the remainder of the max clique. So that couldn't have happened. Because you can't separate a subpart of a clique from another subpart of a clique, because everything's connected to everything else. And remember, a separator is a set of nodes. So therefore, the leaf nodes have to be a max clique. So another sort of proposition, which is, I think, an immediate consequence, is that uh, the set of all minimal separators in a graph are included in the non-leaf nodes of the binary decomposition tree. And this is the number of times, the shattering coefficient minus one number of times. That's the number of times that the minimal separator appears. So that essentially allows us to write uh, it in this form. OK. OK, so, um, so the next, this is a critical theorem that we're about to prove. But before we do this, let's define a little bit of notation and then um, move forward. So basically, the notion of shattering is something that we just defined. And it's something that a separator can do. So a separator, C, shatters a graph into, um, into some number of connected components, which is D. right? And um, this is essentially the union of these components. So basically, when we take the induced graph on V except for C, We've got a bunch of these connected components. And so we can name these components. So G1, G2, up to GL. So what does this mean about L? What must L be equal to? Yeah, so L is equal to D of C. That's right. So L is equal to DC. Be the disjoint, and they're necessarily disjoint because it's, shatter it's, it's this notion of shattering. Um, so we have. Um, that if we union together all of these connected components, we get the induced graph. Okay. So we can then take any vertex in any of the components. And let's just have a very simple, this is, gives us a very simple notation. So then G, uh, let's just sum this here. So if we take any vertex here, then if we take G uh, on the induced graph of V except for C, as a function of a, that node, then that gives us back the component i 
where i is the component where a lives in. So it's just a very simple, this is the notation that we're defining here. Okay, so it gives us a very easy way of referring to that component, the component of the shattering by C in which vertex A lives in. Yep, question? Or are you just saying you understand it? Okay. Yeah, okay, I good. Right, so notice that a, a is inside of one of the components, right? So that basically necessarily means that A is not a member of C. Okay. All the components are disjoint, so therefore it's unique. Because A can't live in more than one component. Because remember, the shattering partitions the graph into a set of residual connected components. It's just a convenient notation thing. So we're going to be using that. It's going to be very convenient for the proving the next theorem. So the next theorem states the following. So the next theorem says that a graph is triangulated if and only if it's decomposable. So this is a really important theorem because it basically means that if you've got a triangulated graph, then you can write the probability distribution in this factorization form. Because remember, we got the factorization from the decomposability. Um, so um, Let's uh, take a break and then come back and prove the theorem. Okay, okay so let's, um, let's prove this theorem now. We're back from break. So, uh, so again, the, the theorem is stating that the, this, this class of decomposable monols, which we just talked about, is the same as the class of, or I should say the class of decomposable graphs is the same class of graphs as the class of triangulated graphs. And so we're going to prove this. Um, I think the proof is really nice. It's really cool. So we're going to, first of all, recall from lemma 4.5.6, that a graph is triangulated if and only if it's decomposable. All right, so we have um, uh, triangulated if and only if it's decomposable. And um, what we're going to do to, to prove this theorem, we're going to show that um, um, so sorry. The no, no, this is this is this is. <laughs> I have a typo in the slide. And I'm just writing. I'm just going with this typo. Okay, so um, we have the we have the theorem of 4.5.6 is that every triangulated if and only if every minimal separator is complete. So, hold on a second. Because that, that's, so this is, uh, just ignore this bit here. It's this. And so to prove the current theorem, that uh, decomposability implies that the graph is triangulated. And then the converse will show that uh, this thing holds. So what we're doing today, or what we're doing in this theorem, is really this bit down here. And that will essentially create a cycle, a directed cycle, in the logic of triangulated graphs. Okay, so to start off with, let's first of all assume that it's decomposable, and we want to prove that it's tri triangulated. So we've got a decomposable graph. So first of all, if, if G is already complete, then by definition it's already triangulated. There's no cordless cycles. But if it's not complete, then there's going to be a decomposition. In fact, because it's decomposable, there's going to be a proper decomposition, A, B, C. And it's going to be a decomposition into two subgraphs, which are themselves decomposable, and both of which have fewer vertices. And fewer vertices, we're doing induction on the number of vertices, which basically means that these two things are true. These are strict inductions because of the fact that it's a proper decomposition. Right? Now, the induction hypothesis says that uh, it must be the case that these two induced subgraphs are chordal right away. So what we need to do is make sure that if we take these two subgraphs that are chordal, 
and patch them together via the current decomposition, we haven't created any cordless cycles. So the theorem proceeds as follows. We know that there are no cordless cycles on, on either any of these subgraphs, right? So if there are any cordless cycles, here, uh, let me draw a picture for this. So we've got C here and A here and B here. And we've got this graph here and this graph here. So in the purple part, we know that there are no cordless cycles. In the orange part, we know that there are cordless cycles. So if there are any cordless cycles, it must be the case that the cordless cycle kind of looks like this. All right? It must um, be partly in A, partly in C, and partly in B. But on the other hand, because it's a decomposition, we know that C is complete, so that means that that cycle must have a chord. So therefore, this patching together hasn't caused any cordless cycles. And that proves the first part of the theorem. Okay. Now the next part of the theorem is, again, going back to this part here. Any questions on this part of the theorem? Okay, so the next part of the theorem, so we sort of did this, decomposable implied triangulated. We want to now show that every minimal separator is complete implies decomposability. So we haven't done that yet, so let's not put a check mark there. So let's assume uh, that every minimal AB separator for any arbitrary AB is complete in G. And moreover, assume an induction hypothesis on the number of nodes, again, that if all minimal separators are complete, imply then the model is decomposable for all smaller graphs, strictly smaller graphs. OK. So um, if G is complete, again, that's sort of a trivial case, which we can just sol sort of eliminate. If, it's G, if G is complete, then it's obviously decomposable. The theorem is proven. Otherwise, if it's not complete, then there must exist two um, non-adjacent vertices. And let's highlight these vertices here and here in this picture. Um, with a necessarily complete minimal separator, C. And there's C. Um, and that forms a partition. So the first part of the partition is, so this is this notation that we, we defined earlier, right? So there's, this is the component of the shattering of C that contains A. It's the connected component. Of, after, after we shatter the graph by C, there's one component that contains A. There's another component that contains B. And there might be other components as well. right? So going to this picture a little bit, Zoom in on this picture. Hopefully you guys can see it there. We see that we have one component that contains A, one component that contains B, and we also have this sort of other stuff here, D. Now D, as drawn, is shown sort of as one component, but we don't really care what's in D. D might consist of multiple components, multiple connected components, or it might consist of one connected component, or it might even be empty. But we're not really designating that. What we're just doing is sort of designating the component that contains A, the component that contains uh, the component that contains B, and all of the re remaining components. And so, what we're going to do then is to merge and rename these components into A. So, A is the set of vertices corresponding to the component that contains A and all of D. So that basically means that A is all of this stuff here. This is this is all of A. And B is this here. So B is this stuff here. Okay. Everybody with me? So here's the same picture again. So C is complete, right? So therefore, we see that A, B, C, using this definition of A, here's A again, here's C, and here's B. That forms the decomposition of G. But that doesn't mean it's decomposable. In order for it to be de decomposable, we need to be, it needs to be the case that both this subgraph, the subgraph induced by A and C, which would mean all this stuff here, and the subgraph induced by B and C, which would be all this stuff here, is also decomposable. So what we're going to do is continue is consider the decomposability of A first. So it's the stuff that's sort of highlighted in that in that swimming pool shaped figure. Okay. So is that decomposable? <coughs> 
So let's consider uh, this. So let's say that C1, so now we're, we're taking A, A1 and B1. Let's say that C1, which is here, this is just sort of an example of a possibility. So C1 is a minimal A1, B1 separator in this component. Right? So here's, here's again, is the component that we're worried about. Um, OK, so it's a minimal separator. Now the question is, is C1 also minimal and therefore complete in G as well? Right? So we're, we do know that it's, that it's minimal. It's a minimal separator in G. But it has to, in, in this subgraph, G of A union C, but it has to be a minimal separator in the larger graph, because the assumption was that all minimal separators were complete. Okay. So the question we want to ask is, is C1 also minimal? And therefore, since it's minimal, and we're talking about the graph G, it's also complete in, in G well. And so the argument uh, says that yes. It's also a minimal A1, B1 separator in G. And here's why. So, so the answer is yes. So the, the argument goes like this. When we add back in B to this component, um, there aren't any additional paths from A1 to B1 that circumvent C. So in other words, the argument is that C1 is a minimal A1. So C1 here is a minimal A1, B1 separator. right? And the argument says that there's not, there are not going to be any paths after we add back in B that circumvent C1. And the reason why is that if there was such a path, then C1 wouldn't have been a separator. Right, C, C1 wouldn't have been a separator. Right. And th I'm just going to go through that. You already got it. So good. So if, if there was such a path, then it would necessarily have involved nodes in B, right? Because it's, the, the, it's adding B back in B, which has created that new path, right? And, but on the other hand, if it involves nodes in B, then it needs, it needs to reach B and then return from B. But C is the separator between B and A, right? But that basically means that there's this, there would be a shorter path. And this, let's sort of short circuit this path. Since C is a minimal separator in the original graph and, it's, and all minimal separators are complete, that means that there's a shorter path. But that means that we've created a path that's now circumvented C1 in nodes that don't involve B at all, which, must have, which contradicts the fact that C1 um, is a separator. So therefore, this must mean that C1 is complete in G, right? because that means that C1 is a minimal separator in G, and all minimal separators in G are complete. So C1 is complete in G, which means that it's also complete in this subgraph. And then since C1 is an A1 and B1 are an arbitrary, and C1 is a minimal separator, an arbitrary minimal separator, it must mean that, uh, and then since we say that it's complete, we have the induction hypothesis, which means that that subgraph, G of A union C, must be um, uh, decomposable, which is this bit down here. So then the same exact argument applies to the right-hand side. It applies to this stuff here. I mean, the, we could have just done that. I mean, the, fa the fact that D was involved doesn't really change anything. And so we have the theorem. So therefore, G is decomposable, because we've shown that both the left-hand side and the right-hand side are decomposable. So therefore, um, what it means is that the class of triangulated models is the same as the class of decomposable models. And we've used the fact that in a triangulated model, all minimal separators are complete to prove this theorem. Let's, let's get back to the picture again. So you saw that thing. So now, in some sense, the decomposition or the decomposability of a triangulated model. So uh, by the way, also to remember that that basically means that when we run the elimination algorithm, we get a decomposable model. When we run an elimination algorithm, we get a graph that can be represented. You know, any, any member of that probability distribution can be validly represented as a product of marginals on the numerator and products of separators in the, in the denominator just from running the elimination. Because remember, we already said that elimination is the same as, as triangulated. So in some sense, the decomposability of the model is really going to be critical for us in doing inference. Although, yeah, so you might have wondered. And if you had wondered why uh, the all minimal separators are complete, 
property is important is because it allowed us easily to prove this theorem. So the next definition uh, we need, oh, by the way, are there any questions on this? So the next definition we have is this notion of a tree decomposition. So what this is, is basically we're taking a graph and we're going to sort of turn it into like a tree based on, in some sense, clusters of the vertices. So a tree decomposition is like we take any graph and we take a pair um, my, oh, the, here's a pair. <laughs> so this is one element of the pair. The pair is a set of bundles of nodes, and the other element of pair is this T, which is, which is a tree. So we have a, a set of subsets of the vertices, which is the yellow thing, and then T, which is a graph. And the graph basically consists of a node index set I, which is completely different than the node index set of the original graph. This is just some other tree and a set of edge set F. And this isn't meant to be F as in fill-in. These are just some other edges. And then we have this, this cluster set where for each um, cluster, each cluster of original graph nodes corresponds to one node in this tree. And so it's a collection of subsets. And now, in order for it to be a tree, tree, tree decomposition, we need to have a number of different properties being true. First of all, that if we union together all the clusters, we, um, we get back the original uh, vertex set of the original graph. So that basically means that um, it's a set cover-like problem. So the, 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 the clusters cover the, ver the node set. Okay. Number two, that it has to be the case that the clusters cover the edge set. So if you're an edge in the original graph, both of your incident vertices need to live in at least one of the clusters, which is this bit. And then most importantly, I should, it's not most importantly, but it is very important. If, if we take any vertex, and then we take any, we take the clusters that correspond to those that contain that vertex, which is this stuff here, then that contains, that, that constructs a connect, connected tree. So let me just draw a picture for this last thing. So, we, so we're using sort of clouds as clusters. And let's connect them with edges. Okay. If we were to take All of the clusters that involve V, there's say V, V, and V, and V, it has to be a, a subtree, a connected subtree. So in other words, if we were to take all the clusters that involved V and there was a gap, like V lived over there but not in this one, that wouldn't be a tree decomposition. So it's sort of like an induced subtree property, which is actually going to be a property that we're about to define. So this is invalid, but this is okay. What about this? Is this okay? What about this, if V lived everywhere? Would that be okay? Yes. What it would it be if... Um, v lived nowhere? <laughs> would that be a tree decomposition? No, because it property one would be, would be uh, not... Uh, this would be violated. What if it was the case that V lived in only one cluster? Would that be OK? Yeah, still a subtree. So that's fine. OK. So there's the notion of tree width. So the tree width, which we defined in the context of a K tree, also has a, con uh, has a place here in the context of a tree decomposition. The tree width is equal to the size of the maximal cluster in a cluster tree, minus 1. So it's exactly equal to this. Now, one problem which you might, for example, um, think that we would want to do is, for example, finding the cluster tree, uh, so, um, finding the tree decomposition cover 
of a, of a graph that has minimal tree width. But this, for the very same reasons that we saw last time, turns out to be an NP-complete optimization problem and also has an approximability problems, or difficulties, I should say. But the question is, how does this relate to our problem? You can imagine, I mean, if you're sort of thinking about this, that there might be some tree decomposition of our original graph that allows us to go back and define messages in exactly the analogous way that we define messages back in a one tree case, but that allows us to solve infants exactly. And, that, and if, you, if you thought that, then you'd be exactly right. So the question is, we need to sort of gain some intuition and some additional ways of viewing the notion of a tree decomposition. So what we're going to do is by looking at a number of different uh, definitions, um, see how when we're doing exact inference, we'll inevitably, ultimately, finally end up uh, in these nice, this nice over area over here, which actually looks pretty nice over there. That's where I would want to go if I was on this road, wouldn't you? I wouldn't want, like if you were going to camping, would you want to camp there? Probably not. I, w I would go here for camping. So let's make this a little bit more mathematically precise than this figure uh, says. So um, let's first of all define a, the notion of a cluster graph. Okay. So what we're going to see is a sort of inc a set of increasingly more powerful definitions. So what we're going to do is we're going to form, we're going to take a graph G. And we're going to form a new graph where the new graph has vertices which correspond to clusters of the original vertices in the original graph. And there's an edge in this new graph if it's the case that there exists some intersection between the clusters. So in other words, define this set of clusters as C1 through CI. And we have, we have a set of size of I clusters of nodes. So that basically means that CI, each CI is a subset of the set of vertices. And we have a new graph where the vertices are the indexes of the clusters, the indices of the clusters. And there exists an edge in this cluster graph if there's some intersection, meaning if the intersection between the two corresponding clusters is non-zero. So what we're going to use often is like Sij is equal to the set of vertices in the original graph that correspond to the intersection of the two corresponding clusters, CI and CJ. So what this point is saying is that cluster nodes have an edge between them if and only if there is non-zero intersection between um, the clusters or the cluster graph nodes. And now a cluster tree is basically a cluster graph that's a tree. So it's really the same thing, but it's a tree. So let's see some examples. Here's an example of a, of a graph. The original graph is on the left. Okay. And the um, um, cluster graph is on the right. And you can see that there exists this edge. Edge 1, 2 exists. And the reason why is because the intersection between the two corresponding clusters, C1 and C2, is equal to FA. Right? However, this edge doesn't exist. because the intersection between cluster 1 and cluster 6 is the empty set. So that edge does not exist. And then if we remove all of the blue edges, then we get a cluster tree. It's very simple. Okay. So, so the, we're not really saying anything. In fact, the original graph edges so far have had nothing to do with any of this stuff. Right? It's only based on the set of cluster nodes. We haven't said anything about the original graph edges. Um, How can you just remove the blue edges? Oh, I'm, I'm just, this is just sort of as an example. So I'm saying like this is a cluster graph. If I were to remove these blue edges, we would be left with what we're defining to be a cluster tree. Why is it a cluster tree? Because there are no cycles in the cluster graph. It's a, it's a cycle-free cluster graph. That's a cluster tree. I could remove edges other than the blue edges. In fact, I could remove um, the black edges and I'd, I'd get a cluster tree corresponding to just the blue edges. But it has to be a tree. For it to be a tree, it has to be connected. The clusters have to be connected in 
in a tree, it's necessarily a unique path between any two clusters. Well, let's look at the definition. A cluster tree is a tree with vertices corresponding to clusters and edges corresponding to pairs. We label each, so it's not the same definition. We label each vertex by the set of graph nodes in the corresponding cluster and label each edge by the cluster intersection. It doesn't say that there's necessarily an edge. In a cluster graph, there's an edge if there's a non-intersection. In a cluster tree, we remove that requirement. The, the requirement was Yeah, this requirement doesn't exist in the cluster tree. Okay, got it. Okay, I didn't say that, but so you you were right to ask that question. So, other question. Okay. Um, remember, the only bad question is the unasked question. So, if you have a question and you haven't asked it, that's a bad question. The only it it becomes good. See, the, the definition of good is, is what one does with a question. Um, so, like we said, these cluster graphs and cluster trees are just sort of meant as sort of a conceptual stepping stone towards where we want to go with, junction, with ultimately junction trees. Um, and in fact, so far, this, this definition hasn't, isn't particularly going to be that useful because, in particular, we haven't said anything about the original graph edges. So what we want to do is talk about cluster graphs, and in particular, cluster trees, that have certain additional properties. But before we do that, make sure that it's clear what a cluster graph is and what a cluster tree is. So let's define one such property, which we're going to call a cluster intersection property. And what the cluster intersection property says is that if you've got a cluster tree, then if you take any two nodes, first of all, if you take any two nodes in the cluster tree, so let's draw a cluster tree. I guess I should be consistent and draw clouds as the nodes. So there's a cluster tree. right? If I take any two nodes in the cluster tree, then there's necessarily going to be a unique path between those two nodes. That's, a def that's because it's a tree. And then we could define this guy to be C, C1 and this one to be C2. And C1 and C2 might have some intersection. C1 in intersects C2, since these are original graph vertices. In order for the cluster intersection property to hold, it must be the case that C1 intersects C2 must be a subset of all of the cliques that live on the path between the two vertices. So in other words, C1 intersect C2 would have to be a subset of, of this guy here and this guy here. But it doesn't have to be a subset of that one here. It doesn't have to be a subset of that one. So here's a cluster graph. right? Um, this is a cluster tree we're claiming. I mean, if we look, for example, at the intersection between say, this guy and this guy, what's the intersection? So f is definitely there, um, g is not there, a is there, and b is there. So we have to make sure that on this path, f, a, and b live everywhere. So for this to be a cluster tree, so sorry, for, for a for the cluster intersection property to hold. So F, A, um, oh, so does B live there? So it doesn't. So an F doesn't live there, and F doesn't live there. So therefore, this is, does the cluster intersection property hold here? No. The cluster intersection property does not hold, although, although it is a cluster tree. So it's a cluster tree that violates the cluster intersection property. I think we've already uh, shown one example. But you can see, again, just right away that if we look at F here, and f here. So f lives there, but it doesn't live there, and it doesn't live there. So therefore, the cluster intersection property is violated. But if we take the same clusters and just change the edges, let's erase this stuff so you can 
get the full effect of all we're really doing here. So we're just taking the same set of clusters and just changing the edges. Suddenly, it obeys the cluster intersection. Let's do, say, maybe a really long distance one, like between this one and this one. So FGAB and DKEJ. So the intersection between those two cluster vertices is the empty set. And so just by definition, that, that always holds. The empty set is a subset of all sets. But if we take something like involving F, like this guy, these guys are very close to each other now. And so F, B, and A live on that path. Or the inter I mean, there's only one. They're, they're connected, so that just by, that holds. But maybe something a little bit less non-trivial, say 1 and 2. So F and A. So in order for it to for cluster intersection property to hold, we need it to live there, which basically means that, that A and B need to live to be here. And, and K doesn't, because K doesn't live in 1, and F doesn't live in 2. So it's really just A and B. OK, so that was the cluster intersection property. The next property is a little bit tricky, and people tend to um, get confused about it when they first hear about it. But it's a really critical one. And this is also sort of the traditional one that you hear about in the context of junction trees. And it's called the running intersection property. And this is also the name that we're going to give to all of these properties once we see that they're all the same. So the running intersection property says is the following. It basically says we take an ordering of these clusters. So it's a specific ordering. So there's C1, C2, C3, and so on and so forth. It's an ordered sequence of these, of these subsets. Then the ordering obeys what's called the running intersection property, or RIP. If it is the case that for all i, for all partial orders, um, there exists a, a, an earlier cluster j such that the intersection of the cluster i and the entire history up to i is the same as the intersection of cluster i and that one sort of specially designated cluster j. So another way of saying this, this is that cluster j is sort of a surrogate for the entire history of clusters in this order. So if you take the intersection of ci and cj, that's the same as your intersection of ci and everything that came before you. Um, and so the running intersection properties, of course, is defined in terms of clusters in the graph. And so we can say that the running intersection property holds on an unordered set of clusters if it is the case that there is some ordering for which the running intersection property holds. So we can also talk about running, running intersection property holds for unordered sequences, or un, un, unordered sets of clusters, just by ordering them and making sure running intersection property holds. So let's, let's actually make this a little bit more intuitive and clear. I know we're running out, running out of town, but let's just do this, because I think this, this will sort of help. So we've got a sequence of clusters. And let's define the history. So the history is basically the clusters, the union of the clusters up to i. Okay. The innovation, or, or the residual, is kind of like the new stuff that's in ci that's not in the history up to i minus 1. This is like the new stuff in i that's not in your hist previous history. And then the, the commonality, or the separation, or the redundancy, if you will, is basically the intersection between ci and your entire history. And so basically, just by definition, we have that any cluster is equal to its residual plus its innovation. Right? Every cluster can be represented as, basic, as, a, as, a, as a partition based on what, it, what came before it redundantly and that new stuff. And so the running intersection property states that if you have an ordering that CI's intersection with this whole history, namely this, is the same as CI's intersection with just that specially designated cluster CI. And that's represented by S, which is the intersection between CI and CJ. OK. Now, are there any questions? OK, don't forget to start doing your homework.
uh, start tonight. Um, and I will see you on Monday.